it back. Could be an hour. I can I can turn it down. But Mornings are tougher. Thanks, folks. Yeah, yeah. So lunch is better. Yeah, that's all right. That's, I'm glad we can do it. <coughs> it went back. Should I cough it up again? Get it done. down there. Um, can I see it on the screen? On this screen? No, this one. That's black. Oh, okay. That's okay. Um, I think I'll. I think. Yeah. Why don't you do that? Um, but just wait for me to nod. That way. I'm going to have to read from there because I don't. Um, I usually have it in front of me at a podium, and I can see the slides, and I know they're going. So I'm going to have to turn back, and <coughs> that's all right. Well, we could deal with it. Do it like that. I think one of those light ones can go down. Oh, yep, I'm sorry.
Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. Actually, not from the Alaska Permanent Fund. Those are the big guys. They're down in Juneau. They have about $42 billion of assets under management. I'm with Alaska Permanent Capital Management. We're an independent investment management. We have about $3 billion, and we're located in Anchorage. So there is, there's a difference between those two um, entities. People always get them confused. They don't mind that too much, actually, when they get them. They seem to get more attention when they're somehow being associated with the Permanent Fund. Anyway, um, today I want to chat with you about uh, John Maynard Keynes. Actually, Maynard Keynes. Only his mother calls him John. Um, probably the most famous economist in history, maybe. And I think if you Google Adam Smith economist and Google John Maynard Keynes economist, uh, Adam Smith actually comes up a little higher than John Maynard Keynes. So obviously a very famous economist, um, certainly the most famous economist of the 20th century. In some ways a polarizing figure, in, in some ways, because you know Keynes really gave us the rationale for government spending. Keynes kind of invented macroeconomics he gave us the rationalization for government spending, and if you're a big government spender, you kind of like that and invoke Keynes's name and all his theories, and if you're on the other side of that argument, Keynes, somehow that's not such a good name you want to kind of throw around. So he, he kind of has that, um, that aspect of, about him. Um, I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to give you a little biography if I can about Keynes. I want to tell you, you know, where we, where we grew up, what he did, a little bit of a history about him. I'm also then going to talk in that segment about his personal investing style, kind of what was he doing in terms of investments. And as you'll see, it turns out, uh, certainly later in life, he was a terrific invest investor, ended up um, uh, when he died in 1946 with $25 million in today's dollars. Uh, it's a portfolio worth that, so quite, a, quite an investor. I also, though, want to speak about, in the second part of the presentation, uh, an academic paper by two uh, British um, economists who looked carefully at Keynes' tenure as the bursar or the portfolio manager for Cambridge University. That was his alma mater. And he was the portfolio manager on that from 1923 to 1946 and pretty much had discretion to do what he wanted to do. So we have a real-life track record of Keynes, real-life track record. The personal stuff is just anecdotal. We really don't have a much of a track record. But here we have a track record of Keynes, and we'll kind of take a look at that and see what was his investment style. And in fact, I'll, uh, the punchline is his style changed. I mean, he was a top-down macro guy through most of the 1920s, buying and selling securities based on what he thought the economy was going to do. He switched in the early 1930s to much more of a valued, bottom-up kind of stock picker with spectacular results, actually. That's the second part. And the third part, if we have time, I would like to just talk a little bit about Chapter 12 of the General Theory. This is a very famous chapter on um, long-term expectations. In some ways, it kind of um, I I is the first sort of uh, uh, behavioral finance type um, uh, as aspect of, of Keynes. So he, um, it's psychology, it's long-term expectations. This is a chapter that guys like um, Warren Buffett would read. Uh, David Swenson of Yale has certainly read the chapter. Both of these guys are big fans of um, Keynes and his investment style. So. So that's kind of what we're going to do. So first of all, let's just start with Keynes. He was born in 1883, the same year that Karl Marx died, by the way. Um, his parents brought him home, home to 6 Harvey Road, which was a very nice house in Cambridge. Not, not a mansion, not a estate, but a nice home in Cambridge. He was kind of middle class, upper middle class, I suppose you could say. And um, his father, um, Neville Keynes, was a professor at Cambridge University, and are you going to, should I do this? Yeah. Okay. Um, was a professor at Cambridge University, and his mother uh, was a um, stay-at-home mom. She did good work. She was involved in charity. She was the first uh, female mayor of Cambridge. So we had an intellectual kind of environment as, as, a, as, a, as a child. He was uh, very precocious. Uh, went to the very best schools in, as a child in, in kind of elementary school. Someone said to him, um, how do you pronounce your last name? He said, it's Keynes, as in brains. Okay, so he had that aspect of him. He was a little bit full of himself even, even as a child, and actually throughout his life he knew that he was a bit of a prodigy, I suppose. After he went to Eton, Eton is a private school, a very fancy private prep school in, in Britain. 
He spent kind of his high school years in Eton, and then it was on to Cambridge University, uh, where he, um, he, 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 got to, he went there on a scholarship. But he was tutored throughout his life, early life at least, by his dad and his mother, because to get scholarships, you had to score very well on these exams. So he was very much into studying and, and, and that sort of thing early in his life. He gets to Cambridge, and he majors in mathematics, not economics. So Keynes didn't take any economics courses as an undergraduate at, at Cambridge. He graduated, though, in um, 1903, I guess it was. Let's see, 190, no, 1905. He graduates from Cambridge in um, 1905 and takes, the, um, takes the, the mathematics exam that everyone would take then. He scores 12, which is quite disappointing, actually. I mean, he had throughout his life was always number one or number two in all of these exams or contests, etc. What that meant was he couldn't just go on and teach immediately. You have to be one or two to do that. So he kind of had to find out what was he going to do um, with his life as he was kind of leaving Cambridge. And if you, he, um, he writes to his friend Lytton Strachey around this time when he's leaving, Marshall, Alfred Marshall, a very famous economist at the time, is continually pestering me to turn professional economist and write flattering remarks on my papers. Do you think anything will come of it? I doubt it. After he graduates, he starts taking some courses in economics from Alfred Marshall. And Alfred Marshall was the most famous economist of, of that time period. His book, Principles of Economics, was sort of like Paul Samuelson, if you remember that book in, in economics. It was really used for decades. If anybody had a question about economics at the time, they would say, well, just go look in Marshall. It's in Marshall. So Alfred Marshall is very, and he thinks Keynes is terrific, and he's encouraging Keynes, so you should start taking more and more economics. So after graduating, he's now taking economics classes, et cetera, and he's starting to think about being an instructor uh, in economics, and eventually he becomes an instructor professor in economics, although as far as I know, the guy doesn't have a master's degree in economics or a PhD in economics. He's pretty much not self-taught, but he was really kind of stuck around Cambridge and learned from Marshall. In fact, when we think about Keynes's life, he was pretty much at Cambridge teaching or taking the train into the city of London to either um, speculate in the financial markets or to work for the government. That's kind of, if you want to think about his life, it's, it's very much moving back and forth between Cambridge and London um, pretty much for his entire, his entire life. Um, what's the next one say? Yeah. Um, he also writes to Lytton Strachey at the time, I want to manage a railroad or organize a trust or at least swindle the investment public. It's so easy and fascinating to master the principle of these things. So again, this is somebody who's pretty confident about his abilities, right? The Bloomsbury Group. I, I want to say something about the Bloomsbury Group because Keynes was a member of the Bloomsbury Group. And what is the Bloomsbury Group? This is a group in the early 1900s of writers, of artists, of philosophers who really um, are challenging uh, Victorian, uh, Moore's Victorian morals, um, very anti-Victorian. They're very much into themselves. The Bloomsbury Group is kind of all about themselves and making themselves happy and, and having pleasure for themselves and really pushing back at Victorian morals. So they, they have quite a, a reputation in England at the time. Bloomsbury is this part, a little kind of part of uh, London, not far from, um, not far from uh, the British Museum. And Bloomsbury, as they say, wasn't a place, though. It's not a place. It's a state of mind. And I, I mention this because I think it had a real influence on Keynes. And in fact, when you think about Keynes, you have this, this one side of Keynes where he grew up. His parents were very Victorian. He's sort of um, part of the establishment, I guess, if you will. And yet the other side of him is this Bloomsbury group that was very bohemian kind of uh, group. They would have people like Virginia Woolf, the writer, was part of Bloomsbury. Vanessa Bell, her sister, was a painter and part of the Bloomsbury group. Uh, Bertrand Russell, the philosopher. G.E. Moore, another philosopher, part of Bloomsbury. And these guys would meet every Tuesday night, and they would talk about all kinds of different things. That's kind of what the Bloomsbury group was about but very much pushing back against government. The war comes, the, the First World War arrives in 1914. Bloomsbury, as you can imagine, is very anti-war. All of the men at um, uh, Bloomsbury, they're conscientious objectors. They don't want to go to the war. Keynes did, though, serve in the Treasury in the war, and, and he really developed skill in currency trading in, in the war because he was helping to finance British, the British um, uh, soldiers, the British, British in the war, First World War. 
who was very much helping them do that and learned a lot about currencies and finance and became quite an expert during that. Bloomsbury was not pleased with him. And George Bernard Shaw, another member of the Bloomsbury group, said, you know, Keynes's job was to kill as many Germans at the least amount of cost. So they were not happy with him at all. The war ends. And Keynes, because he's done so well in the Treasury now, and he's become this sort of financial expert, is asked to go to Paris, where we negotiate the Treaty of Versailles. And the next slide shows the uh, World War I. The end of World War I, the Treaty of Versailles, you have uh, Clemenceau, um, Woodrow Wilson, and um, Lord George, the British Prime Minister, all negotiating how are we going to conclude this war, and particularly how much is Germany going to pay? Because this was, this was a conference that was going to make Germany pay for the war. Keynes thought that was a disaster. He said, they can't afford it. They can't possibly afford to do this. We have to try and you know, lift uh, everyone up. And, he, and as a result of that, and he, he tried as best he could to get the, um, the parties together. And they just wouldn't. They were out for revenge. He said, revenge will not rain. And he forecast on the next slide in his book, The Economic Consequences of Peace, which he wrote about six months after leaving the conference. The book was a sensation, first of all. It was a bestseller throughout the world. He characterized the Treaty of Versailles as a Carthaginian peace. It was going to ruin Germany, and this would lead to no good. Germany, he said, was treated unfairly. In economic terms, the treaty will lead to ruin and maybe worse. This just, it was a sensation. I mean, I can't quite tell you how in terms of reading what people thought about this, but they, throughout the world, it was just a bestseller because people were very concerned about what was going to happen after the war. And, you know, how were we going to pay? Germany was going to pay reparations, but then, of course, Britain and France owed a lot of money to the United States. Would the United States forgive those loans? They wouldn't. Um, Coolidge said they hired the money, didn't they? So, no, we, w we wanted our money back, the United States. And so it really turned out, in, in hindsight, in a way, uh, it was a pretty good forecast for what was to come in terms of Mussolini and Hitler and all the turmoil in there. And it really, as, as years went by, it raised Kane's stature as a pretty good forecaster. So, end of the war, um, Roy Herod, his, one of his biographers, says in the 1920s, uh, Keynes was for a time in bad odor among grave persons. Why? Because he skewered everybody. He was at the table behind the scenes, and he really um, lampooned and ridiculed Clemenceau and Lord George and Wilson. So the establishment was just horrified that he would tell everybody the inside story about what was going on at the Treaty of Versailles. So he was really on the out in the 1920s with official circles. He was writing. He started to write. He became the editor of the Economic Journal, which he stayed the editor for about 30 years. It's quite a famous academic kind of journal. He wrote books. He wrote newspaper articles. He was kind of a pundit and tried to influence popular opinion. I think you could think of him during this period as Paul Krugman. You know Paul Krugman, the New York Times columnist? You know his style of writing? I think that's kind of how you can think about Keynes during this period of the 1920s. He was also teaching a little bit, again, going back and forth between London. He had a house in the Bloomsbury District in London, and he had also um, uh, he had later purchased an estate in, uh, outside of London. He was consulting. He was on the investment committee for two insurance companies, National Mutual and Provincial Insurance, and he really remained there for at least 20 years or so as kind of an investment advisor to these uh, people. He was also investing his personal money, and again, as I mentioned, he started to invest for his Cambridge University, but we'll focus just on his personal investing now. He was a scientific gambler who played the cycle. That's how he saw himself, I suppose, in the 1920s. Okay, um, we have to talk about Lydia and Maynard. Lydia Lakokova, the Bloomsbury ballerina, and Keynes. Keynes fell in love with Lydia in the early 1920s, and this was a complete shock to everybody because Keynes was gay. He was homosexual. He was gay. In fact, he was a gay sex maniac, to tell you the truth. I mean, Keynes had dozens of affairs and encounters uh, before he had met Lydia. But he met her, and they fell in love. And two, three years later, in 1925, if we just go to the next slide, they were married. And here you have a picture of Mr. and Mrs. Keynes in 1925. 
and what you don't see here is there act this is just sort of a little snap of a, a broader picture but if you kind of pan back you would see hundreds of cameras and newspaper people surrounding this couple as they walked out of their their uh, reception because this he's a very famous guy by this by 1925 he wrote the economic consequence of the peace he was writing in all newspapers throughout the world he had this style a sarcastic kind of style of skewering people in high places and so he was quite a famous person, and she was quite famous as the premier ballerina of the Russian uh, ballet company. And so it was quite a celebrity uh, marriage, I suppose, uh, at, I suppose at this time. Investing in the 1920s. Okay, let's talk about investing now in the 1920s. What was he doing in terms of investing? Well, he started investing uh, around 1920, as he just as he published his book, and he started investing with a good friend of his, Foxy Falk. You can't make these names up, you know. It really was his name. He was a broker in the city, London's Wall Street, and Keynes and him formed a syndicate or a pool. They pooled their resources. Keynes got his father to contribute some money. He got his Bloomsbury friends to contribute money. He contributed money. They now pooled their money, leveraged up seven to one. Keynes liked leverage. Certainly in the 1920s, he thought it was a pretty good deal, partly because he was pretty smart, he thought. He was smart, but he figured he could, you know, power of leverage is to multiply on the upside. It also works the other way on the downside, as we all know. Anyway, um, he writes to his, his mother in 1920, money is a funny thing with a little extra knowledge and experience of a special kind, it simply keeps rolling in. So Keynes is a currency expert. At the end, he's now speculating in currencies. He thinks the United States is a good place to invest. He thinks inflation is going to roar in Europe. He goes short the pound, short the lira, short the French franc, long the dollar. And for the first month or two or three, it's working out tremendously well, and he's getting fabulously wealthy. He writes to his dad a little bit later while he's off vacationing in Italy, spending all his money. He says, win or lose, this high-stakes game of gambling amuses me. Well, he did make money early on. He had, and I'm going to convert everything to 2012 dollars to kind of give you a sense of the magnitude. But he was up about $2 million dollars. Um, early on in the 1920s for the, uh, for the first few months of the 1920s here, 1920. And then it all fell apart. I mean, this idea was a good idea. He, it was, the logic was sound. The timing, not so much. As we know, things change in the market. And suddenly, the dollar started depreciating. All the currencies that he was short started appreciating. He lost it all. He was given, he had to make margin calls. He went hat in hand back to his dad to help him fund the margin calls. He found another very wealthy benefactor who had confidence in him to stake him and give him more money. So he started again speculating. And within a couple, three years, he was back to about $7 million of profit by like about 1922, 24. So again, this early foray was, um, didn't chase him. I mean, he still had a lot of confidence in himself and so did other people who gave him money. And, and so he, 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 he gained it all back a few years later. Um, what do we have next? Oh, yeah. This is a very famous quote, and I think it says something about Keynes. Um, before this last quote, he more or less said, you know, economists need to focus on more than, than just the long term, right? You know, economists say in the long term we'll have equilibrium. But, you know, in the long term, we're all dead. And he said, economists set themselves too easy, too useless a task with intensity of season. They can only tell us that when the storm is long past, the ocean will be flat. So to me, this is just a little bit of a sign of hubris, though. This is somebody who's pretty confident that they can forecast big picture macroeconomic events. And that was Keynes in the 1920s. He kind of had this credit cycle theory of investing, that he thought he could do that, and that's what you were supposed to do. You liked them or you didn't like them. That was what you did. Okay, next. Um, another quote for investing in the 20s, I think, that says something. He says in uh, one of his books, The Treatise on Money, this is 1930, but, but he says, it may often profit the wisest stock market player to anticipate mob psychology rather than the real trend of events and to ape unreason in anticipation. Thus, so long as a crowd should be relied on to act in a certain way, even if it be misguided, it will be to the advantage of the better informed professional to act in the same way a short time before that short period ahead. This is a momentum guy, really. He's a momentum kind of guy, player. Um, what do we have next? All right, so another quote. Uh, in 1926, he says, there will be no further crash in our lifetime. 
1926. Now this isn't exactly on par with you know Irving Fisher. Stocks have reached a permanently high plateau about a week before the crash, if you, if you remember that quote. But it's not far away. Anyway, um, the stock market does crash. Keynes writes to Lydia in October of 1929. Wall Street did have a go yesterday. Did you read about it? The biggest crash ever recorded. I have been in a thoroughly financial and disgusting state of mind all day. I mean, that was because during this period of time, Keynes had decided to speculate on commodities. He was drawing tin and cotton and rubber, those kind of commodities, thinking that the United States economy was doing really well, and he didn't anticipate what happened in the stock market. So suddenly, his personal portfolio again, things just collapsed. He lost 80% of his money in this 1929-1930 period partly because he was also leveraged. He tried to sell some of his paintings. Keynes was a great collector of paintings. He had Matisse's, Monet's, Manet's, Picasso's, Seurat's. He collected old masters. Well, I guess, well, I guess they weren't old masters at the time. But anyway, <laughs> he collected uh, avant-garde new, new, new painters, I suppose. Anyway, um, he tried to sell them. He couldn't get a bid at his reservation price. I should mention, too, he was also a great collector of books. So he's a little bit of a Renaissance man, this guy, right? Big, big collector of books. In fact, when he died, uh, he had the, the best collection of the papers of Sir Isaac Newton that there was out there. He donated them back to Cambridge University. Isaac Newton was, went to Cambridge. Uh, so, but he was, he, he, was do, he was doing a lot of, of things and also involved in the arts. He liked the arts a lot. Okay, um, so that's the 20s. 1930s, what's Keynes up to in the 1930s? Well, he's, he's worried about the Great Slump. That's what they might have called it in Great Britain, the Great Slump, the Great Depression. He writes, and he wants to kind of get people's spirits up. He's, he was an optimistic kind of guy. I mean, the cup is half full for Keynes. So he wants to get the spirits up. He says, the other was not a dream. In other words, the 1920s, at least in the United States, that wasn't a dream. That was not a dream. This, what we're going through right now, is a nightmare, which will pass away in the morning. Again, trying to get people to think, look, all is not lost. You have to remember, back in the 19, late 20s, 19, uh, 1930s in particular, was capitalism doing real well? Not really. In the 20s, in the 20s, but the 30s hit, and suddenly there are questions about capitalism. Socialism is better. Communism is better. Out with capitalism, in with these, these other isms. Totalitarianism is on the rise, in fact, with Mussolini and with Hitler, Stalin. So people were, it was a very difficult period. There were clashes between people about what was the best way to get us out of this slump, this, this Great Depression as it started to get deeper and deeper and deeper into the 1930s. So Keynes says, the resources of nature and man's devices are just as fertile and productive as they ever were. We are as capable as before of affording for everyone a high standard of life. We were not previously deceived, but today we have involved ourselves in a colossal muddle, that's a favorite word of his, having blundered in the control of a delicate machine, the workings of which we do not understand. So he has this analogy to a car. He used to talk a lot about cars. He used that analogy. He never learned how to drive, but he talked a lot about cars. And he's sort of saying to us, you know, that look, there's a lot of gas in the tank. The motor's fine. We just have these little glitch here. We need to kind of work on that. And he says, the machine has merely been jammed as a result of the muddle. So... So Magneto trouble, he says to you folks, right? Magneto trouble. Um, well, not, ma not that Magneto. He talked about <laughs> that Magneto, okay? This is the ignition system of a car. That's what Britain calls mag the Magneto system. So think of it as a kind of a spark plug. That's what Keynes is saying when he says Magneto. There's a spark. We need a spark. We need to get this thing going. He writes his, his, uh, his general theory, his, his magnum opus, the one of the most famous books ever written, in 1936, he says, classical theorists resemble Euclidean geometers in a non-Euclidean world, who, discovering that in experience, straight lines apparently parallel often meet, rebuke the lines for not keeping straight as the only remedy for the unfortunate collisions which are occurring. Yet in truth, there is no remedy except to throw over the axiom of parallels and to work out a non-Euclidean geometry. Classical economics is not working, guys. It's not working. We need to rethink how we think about economics. The market, you know, the 
how fast the economics are all into supply and demand. So, you know, you got the market for fish in a supply and demand curve. You got the market for copper. All these markets out there. And Keynes is saying, they don't work for the macro economy. That's not how you should understand the macro economy. You have to think about the macro economy differently. He did, he's the guy that gave us, you know, GDP equals P plus I plus G plus X minus M. If you remember the macro 101, that's the Keynesian aggregate demand point of view. So, um, here's what he says. He says, classical economics rests on a fundamental error that supply and demand factors will ensure full employment. He doesn't believe that's necessarily true. Certainly not in the short term. Sometimes markets could get out of kilter. He views the economy as unstable and out of equilibrium in the 30s because of underinvestment, not enough investment, and over savings. Too much savings going on. And it's not getting translated into investment. The classics would say, well, not a problem. Interest rates will fall, investments will go up, all will be well in the long run. Well, you know, in the long run, right, we're all dead. Um, he, he says the solution to inadequate private demand was deficit spending by the government. He believed in managed capitalism and that he was saving capitalism from socialism, communism, and totalitarianism. And basically, as, as we know, Keynesianism kind of laid the intellectual foundation for a managed kind of welfare state-oriented form of capitalism adopted by many countries after World War II. And that was the way it was, really, until the 70s when we got to stagflation. And then things changed and the markets kind of made a comeback with Thatcher and Reagan and, and even Bill Clinton, who said, you know, the era of big government is over. But people criticize Keynes not – I think so, some academic economists – think his, his, his theory and uh, his ideas were okay, but what they led to was sort of a, a rationale for people to embrace big government. And this is where I think Keynes, you know, you get these Keynesians and non-Keynesians in the politics comes in because of this, this use of Keynes. Okay. By the way, the, um, the general theory published in 1936, it had some impact on the way people were thinking in the 1930s in the Great Depression. But not that much, actually. By the time it came out, the Great Depression was kind of over a little bit. All right? We'd been through 33, and we were now on the rise. So it had some impact, but it really had an impact after World War II. Yes? <laughs> they did. They did, and, but I don't think that they really came. I don't think that they, they just decided we had to do something. I think that was FDR. Let's just try stuff. Let's do something. And so you had some spending. Although, rem remember, not that much. I mean, the deficit spending under FDR wasn't that much. I mean, I think government spending went from, I'm thinking about 12% of GDP in the 20s to about 15 in the 30s. Not that much, not, not that big a push. I think he revived confidence, FDR. He lifted people's spirits. That was helpful. And then the whole banking system and, and getting the banking system in, in, in better shape and FDIC insurance, I think that helped put things with each other. And what really helped, though, with all these economies was going off the gold standard. The gold standard was really a straitjacket. Just think of it like the euro is today in all these countries where they're stuck. They don't have a currency that they could depreciate and get out of stuff. So that was it. Um, Britain went off the gold standard in 1930. Keynes was very happy about that. He argued against Winston Churchill, in fact, in 1925. Churchill took Britain back on the gold standard at a very high exchange rate. So to defend that exchange rate, Britain had to keep interest rates high. And their exports were expensive to Britain. Keynes thought that was a disaster. He wrote a book called The Economic Consequences of Mr. Churchill, a play on his other book to say this is not a good idea. So when they went off in 1930-31, I think it was, he was happy, and then FDR went off in 1933, very happy. And I think a lot of economists seem to think that had quite an impact on getting us out of the Great Depression. It was the, the straitjacket of the gold standard that kind of that stopped governments from doing a little bit more. Um, Keynes in World War II, well, first of all, I should say he writes the book. It, 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 it's a sensation among academic economists, and then he has a heart attack. And he's kind of laid up for a couple, one to two years, really. He's not doing very much. He's, he's really under the weather. So he's kind of out of commission. Come 1939, 1940, though, he's back. He's recovered. He's now in Keynes in World War II. Mr. Keynes has a plan. Mr. Keynes has a plan to help Britain finance the war. 
he's almost come full circle. In World War I, that's kind of what he was doing, helping them find out the war. And now, here's Haynes, at the, you know, as World War II arrives, shuttling back and forth to the United States six times to try and negotiate how can, we, how can the U.S. help Britain finance the war and what would the global economies look like after the war. So he's very much involved in this. Um, the next slide just shows uh, Bretton Woods, a very famous conference, 1944, up in New Hampshire at the Washington Hotel. Um, and Keynes is very uh, intimately involved in that. Bretton Woods is where it gives us the IMF, it gives us the World Bank, it gives us a system of fixed exchange rates that pretty much lasted until the early 1970s when uh, Nixon took us off the fixed exchange rates. Um, so he's at uh, Bretton Woods. At this time, very famous. People know he's actually quite ill. Um, he's kind of his last speaker. Here he is. This is the last speech of the Bretton Woods Conference, kind of talking about what they've achieved at the conference. He walks into the room. He gets a standing ovation. He finishes his speech, and they all sing for he's the jolly good fellow. So he was quite a famous guy during this period, quite a, a celebrity. He died in 1946, a couple years after this. And as people do, people said, you know, well, do you have any regrets, you know, in life, et cetera? He said, my only regret is I should have drank more champagne. So that's kind of how he viewed life. Um, let's just go quickly and talk about, oh, so I'm sorry. So this is Mr. and Mrs. I, I'm out of print here. This is Mr. and Mrs. Haynes in 1946. So I, th I thought that was an interesting picture because, you know, remember, over here is 1925, and here they are in 1946, and, man, they seem a lot older. Boy, 20 years. I just struck me. I don't know what it was. It just kind of struck me that um, they're probably coming off a boat here or something from one of their trips to the United States. Anyway, let's turn quickly to Keynes and the, um, his personal investing in the 30s. Then we're going to look at institutional investing. Uh, so now we're, we went from the 20s top down. Now we're going to talk about what happened and w was something going on in the 1930s. How was he doing his, his investing? He says, as time goes on, I get more and more convinced that the right method in investment is to put fairly large sums into enterprises which one thinks one knows something about and in the management of which one thoroughly believes. He's writing here to his, the chairman of uh, provincial insurance. He says in 1938, he writes to National Mutual, he argues that it was the duty of serious investors to accept depreciation of their holdings and investors should be aiming primarily at a long period result and judged solely by these. Now this probably is what many of us would like to explain to clients, right? It's the long term. This is just a temporary decline. You know, that, and this, in fact, is Keynes talking to National Mutual. He had a committee to deal with at the insurance company. He wasn't real happy about that. They, they didn't take his ideas um, as he might would have liked them to do, right? And in fact, in 1938, by the way, we had a dip in the stock market, 37 and 38. Keynes lost about two-thirds of his money. But Unlike the previous times when, where he was still trading during those stock markets and selling and buying, this time he did a lot more buying. He's sort of becoming a contrarian investor. He's, a he's saying, I'm holding on for the long term. He's, he's, his style changed. He writes to his friend Richard Kahn, a student in 1938, and he says, I can only say that I was the principal inventor of credit cycle investing. Just think top-down kind of investing and have seen it tried by five different parties acting in detail on distinctly different lines over a period of nearly 20 years, which has been full of ups and downs, and I have not seen a single case of a success being made of it. So he's really saying, mea culpa. This was me in the 20s. Doesn't work. He writes to his friend Jas uh, Jasper Ridley, the central principle investment is to go contrary to the general opinion on the grounds that if everyone agreed upon its merits, the investment is inevitably too dear and too, and therefore unattractive. Finally, um, this is actually a memorandum, a famous memorandum to his, to his college, Kings College, 1938. In fact, he, every year he would talk about investments, and it was just a mad, everybody wanted to attend and hear what Kings had to say about investments and how the college trusts were doing. He says, again, I'm clear the idea of wholesale shifts is for various reasons impractical, indeed undesirable. Most of those who attempt it sell too late and buy too late and do both too often, incurring heavy expenses and developing too unsettled and speculative a state of mind. That kind of rings home to me. He talked about it was important to carefully select investments, a steadfast approach to holding fairly large units through thick and thin. And he also talks about 
that's why it's important to have a balanced investment position. And by that, he doesn't mean diversification per se. He's saying a variety of risks in spite of individual holdings being large and possibly, and possibly opposed risks, e.g., hold some gold shares among equities because they'll go contrary. So that's what he means by balance. He doesn't mean have a lot of diversification. In fact, you'll see he, that's not him. He likes concentrated portfolios. Okay. Let's now talk about Keynes' the institutional investment. This is kind of a little, maybe six or seven slides on an academic paper written last year by, if we go to the next slide, I'll remember, by Chambers and Dimson, um, two British economists. So this is the name of the paper, Keynes, the stock market investor. And as I mentioned earlier, what they did was they looked at his track record when he was the portfolio manager for the Cambridge um, discretionary portfolio. They looked, they had data. So they look at and they say, his Keynes portfolios were idiosyncratic and approached unconventionally. He was a leader among institutional investors in making a substantial allocation to the new asset class equity. Furthermore, he documented a radical change, we documented a radical change in Keynes' approach to investment, which was to the considerable benefit of subsequent performance. So he was a leader among institutional investors in making a substantial allocation to equity. That was the new asset class. In the 1920s, did institutions own equities? No. Equities were risky. They owned bonds. They owned real estate. That's what they owned. People didn't start buying equities until what? When? The 40s or the 50s, and even in the United States, that's institutions. So he made a big commitment, though, to equities. He saw equities as the next great asset class. It was very difficult to do that at the time because the equity risk premium, how well had equities done versus um, bonds from 1900 to 1920? They're about even. Equities got a little advantage. Maybe it was 25 basis points. But equities weren't where it was at. That was, that was risky. So he saw them as, as a different kind of asset, a share of ownership, and a share in the economy, and those things were going to move forward. Okay, so let's look at the, the discretionary portfolio that he ran, um, and we'll compare it to the UK index. This is the UK index, and you can see that from 1921 to the 1946, the UK index, it rose, we're going to, we start everything at 100, to about 800 and Oh, 850, I think, 9%. And this is Keynes' return on that discretionary portfolio. That's what it looks like. And what do we see? Well, first of all, over the period, he was around over 5% better than the UK equity index. But look at where he is from 1921 all the way up to 31. No big deal, right? And he's really just kind of from bouncing around close to the benchmark. In fact, in the five years ending 1930, though, on a cumulative basis, he was 45% below the benchmark that, that last five years of the 1920s. You'd think the college would fire him, right? They didn't because he was Keynes. They, they had complete confidence in him. He could do whatever he wanted. It's kind of nice, actually, to have that kind of long-term horizon, right? I mean, you, you don't have to worry. You could stick it out, and he did, and he eventually it, it worked, when he, when he, particularly when he changed course. So that's his portfolio. Here's another way to look at it. This is just from Wall Street Journal. I kind of like the slide, so I just stole it. Um, they, they, they title it, Keynes the Investor by Switching Approaches Mid-Career. Mid -career, uh, Keynes became a star, and they, they show some average returns in the, from 24 to 32. It shows him doing better. A lot has to do with the time period chosen. I think he was up and down if you look at the real life data. And you can get this paper on the Internet. It's no big deal. Um, look at the... Um, the change, though, when he goes bottoms up, fundamental stock picking, suddenly he's a much better investor. Um, let's look at a few statistics, um, change in strategy. Well, maybe um, this is the turnover in the discretionary portfolio at Cambridge. 1929, 1921 to 29, the 20s, about 55% on average turnover. Then you look at the 30s down to 30, and then the 40s, he's at about 14 turnover. So he is becoming much longer term kind of investor. Um, top holdings as a percent of the total portfolio. I think this is interesting. Um, this show, shows the, the deep dark purple is one investment. What's his top investment as a percentage of his portfolio? And then the uh, lavender, is that what that is? Light purple? Um, that's the top five holdings as a percent of the portfolio. And what can you see from that? I mean, pretty concentrated. I, think I was a little shocked, actually. I don't know. I'm not a stock jockey. I don't do equities, but... I kind of thought, wow, 15% in one name, 21%, 11% in one name in your portfolio? That's a lot. 
and then the top five being almost 50% of your portfolio in the 30s, that seems like it is quite quite a concentration. In fact, let me see if I have some other statistics here that I can um, quote to you. Just um, we'll go well. First of all, I should should say that you know I think there's always a um, how do you strike the right balance between sort of your conviction and the need for a diversification? That's always tough. But this seems to me to be someone who's very concentrated and very confident of of what he owns. Um, so what are, what, are, what are her major accomplishments? As I mentioned, first to allocate to a major new asset class, equities. She's changed course um, mid-career, really, from top down to bottom up. And in fact, the authors of the paper, um, they run a Quant Andrews breakpoint test. I really don't know what that is exactly, but apparently um, it allows you to, it reveals a structural break in Keynes' performance in 1932. So they think statistically they could show that something changed in the way he was investing. Um, and they say whereby he became a strong contrarian in the stock market after 1932. They found, by the way, no statistical evidence of his market timing ability. No evidence of that. Um, they also, though, found that Keynes, um, like many investors, had a desire to avoid regret. I guess that's called the disposition effect, where one sells the winners early and holds on to the losers. So Keynes was also subject to that kind of uh, error, I suppose you might say, in, um, in thinking. By the way, um, the tracking error on his portfolio, right? If you're an institutional asset manager, tracking error means something to you. The tracking error of his portfolio versus that UK uh, equity index was 15.2% per year. No, I'm sorry, was 12.6% per year. 12.6%, that's huge, isn't it? That's unbelievable. 12.6, the authors note that the average tracking error for U.S. endowments um, from 02 to 07 was about 3.4% a year. So this is a tremendous tracking error he's got. He's got very idiosyncratic kind of bets um, going on. And they also note, the authors, that the, um, in terms of that tracking error, that at the 95th percentile endowments tracking error was 6.3%. He's got a lot. He's very different than the underlying benchmark. Um, he has size and value tilts. He, he preferred smaller stocks, and he was a value-oriented investor. He tilted towards value at the time, actually. Did, did it hurt you in terms of income to tilt towards value versus bonds? Not at all, actually. In the 1920s and 30s, stocks really were had more dividend yield than, than bonds. Stock yield, his stock yielded, and I'm just going to kind of cuff some numbers. It worked because I could remember this, 654. 6% 6 dividend yields in his portfolio, about 5% dividend yields in the index, and about 4% bond yields at the time. So it was kind of flip of what we, what we think of today. Stocks were risky. They had to yield more. That's what they thought. He was a contrarian. He concentrated his bets, know what you own. He had a terrific track record in his spare time. I mentioned $25 million at his death. That's what his portfolio was worth. We've seen his personal portfolio. We've seen his track record here. In his spare time, there are these stories about Keynes basically, you know, getting up at, oh, 10 or 11 in the morning. He used to party a lot. He was, he was up till 2 in the morning often. He'd get up about 10 or 11 in the morning, sit down in his bed, have his breakfast, read the newspapers, read some research reports, network with people on the telephone. He networked a lot. It does raise a question. Did he have inside information? Probably he did. The authors say, well, yeah, he might have, but he would have considered that a low score. That was, that's the, them saying that. I don't know about that. Um, it wasn't illegal at the time. I mean, it wasn't. But they claim that it probably didn't have a major impact on performance. But it's kind of a, is an issue. Um, and as I said, $25 million. Finally, um, this is a book that I read. I've read a number of books, but I, I like this one, Keynes and the Market by Justin Wall. If you want to read one book about, just learn a little bit about who Keynes was and a lot about investments and value investments and analogies to Warren Buffett and David Swenson and et cetera. This is, a, and it's so easy to read. It's a really easy to read. I read the big, thick Podolsky biography. It's about 100 pages. Very hard to read. It's tough. You just got to gut it out and keep trying to read it, but it's hard. This one is way easier to read. Anyway, Justin Walsh kind of identifies six principles 
of uh, change as an investor. Focus on estimating intrinsic value of the stock rather than time, rather than attempts to divine market trends. We know that. Ensure a sufficiently large margin of safety. And Keynes talked about this in terms of his writings. Now, it doesn't look like he knew Benjamin Graham, you know, the margin of safety guy, the, the guy that, uh, that Graham and Dodd, that, and he was writing in the 1920s, I think, Benjamin Graham was writing in the 1920s. Um, but Keynes also believed in that, a big margin of safety, apply independent judgment in, valuing sto in valuing stocks, adopt the contrary in view, limit transaction costs, ignore market volatility by maintaining a steadfast holding, practice a policy of portfolio concentration by allocating to a few market stunners, he called them, and that's the concentration. He called them the pets, actually, also, but market stunners, things that you really thought were going to be great. If you like it, buy a lot of it. Maintain the appropriate temperament by balancing equanimity and patience with the ability to act decisively. So that's kind of Keynes's philosophy on investing, and, and that's sort of the, the summary of that academic paper that uh, we have. Now, if we have time, um, I could go for another 15 minutes if you like, and we could talk about this famous chapter 12, which is pretty an interesting paper. And as I said, I, I think we should, we should all read it. You, could, you can read it. The general theory is too hard to read. <laughs> it's really hard. Chapter 12 is pretty interesting. I think it's a very interesting thing. Let's kind of, we'll kind of go through it quickly here if I can. Um, here's what he, first of all, um, he's talking in chapter 12 about the state of long-term expectations. He's talking about the stock market in chapter 12. His view that the stock market may not be so helpful for capital formation. It's too, people are too flighty in the stock market. Emotions are ruling the stock market. Short-termism is in the stock market, and that can actually affect real live investments in plant and equipment. Real live decisions to make products can be influenced by all this stuff going on in the stock market. And it's not just interest rates that determine whether or not you should invest. It's the state of confidence, the state of long-term expectations in the market. These are factors that are really important. And even you could push interest rates down to zero, and it might not be enough to encourage investment. That's the quick and dirty summary, I think, of this chapter. All right? So let's just see. I'm going to quote a bunch of stuff that he said. He says, Our knowledge of the factors which will govern the yield of an investment sudden years hence is usually very slight and often negligible. He's saying, you know, we all talk about, you know, investing in the long term, but we really don't know what's going to happen out there five or ten years. It's a leap of faith, guys. It's a leap of faith. If human nature felt no temptation to take a chance, no satisfaction in constructing a factory, a railroad, a mine, or a farm, there might not be much investment merely as a result of cold calculation. You could run all the Excel spreadsheets you want. You know what? It's not enough. Something inside, you know, that decision maker has to say, let's go, because there's, there's so much uncertainty out there. He says the daily revaluations of a stock exchange, though they are primarily made to facilitate transfers of old investments, between one individual and another inevitably exact a decisive influence on the rate of current investments. And here again, when he's talking about investments, he's talking about new plants and things. And you've got to be careful about investment, financial, and then you know, real type investing. He says, so for example, there's no sense in building up a new enterprise. There's no sense of going out and building a factory at a cost greater than that which a similar existing enterprise can be purchased on Wall Street. So in the 1980s, there's no point in going poking holes in the ground and looking for oil. You can buy it way cheaper on Wall Street. That's what he's getting at. He's getting at this replacement cost versus market value kind of a stock. Um, well, so there's an inducement to spend on a project what may seem like an extravagant sum if it can be floated off the stock exchange at an immediate profit. So the stock exchange establishes these values, and if you can build up something, a dot-com company maybe, and IPO it and take it that will, you know, make you a lot of money. And is this a good thing? Is the stock market so efficient that this all makes sense, that this is really what should be driving investment? That's kind of where he's going. It's a Tobin's Q kind of argument in terms of, you know, replacement value versus price. Remember, Tobin's Q takes market value of stocks, it guides them by replacement value. This is kind of a long-term chart for probably the S&P 500. I can't remember exactly, but... Remember, when you get above one, it means that the market price is quite above what replacement or book value, which is a valuation tool, not, not a PE ratio, but people use it from time to time, as, as you all know. And you could see the 1920s were a period when it was very high, and then, of course, the whole dot-com period was quite um, 
quite high. Um, we hit the next, yeah, so, yeah, so when they're very low, you're a buyer of stocks. When they're very high, you're a seller of stocks. James Tobin, this is Paul Tobin, too. This was the economist that really took Keynes' idea and made it into an idea for value in the stock market. So this kind of comes from Keynes. He also talks later in this, in this chapter, again, chapter 12, the state of long-term expectations. He's into, we're into chapter five, section five. There's eight sections, by the way. He says, conventional valuation is established by mass psychology of large number of ignorant individuals. The market will be subject to waves of optimism and pessimism. It's not an efficient market. He says, this, while the social objective of skilled investment should be to defeat the dark forces of time and ignorance, which envelop our future. Okay, he's getting on his high horse here and saying, you know, this is really what investing should be. He says, the private objectives of most skilled investors, those same people who should be doing this, they're doing this. They're just trying to beat the guns, to outwit the crowd and pass the bad or depreciating half crown to the other fellow. They're short, they're short, they're time in the market. They just, as long as they, as long as they can get out, sell it to someone else, they're happy. They don't care about the long term. He says, it's a game of old maid of musical chairs, this investment game in the market. A pastime in which he is victor, he passes the old maid to his neighbor before the game is over. He secures a chair for himself before the music stops. That's what he's thinking about investing. That's what he says about investing. It reminds me, actually, a little bit of what, I think it was Chuck Prince, the Citigroup CEO. Remember when people were saying, well, you know, you're buying a lot of this subprime investment stuff. What, isn't that kind of risky? Chuck Prince famously said, well, you know, um, when the music's playing, you've got to get up and dance. We're still dancing. It's, it's, it's a little bit to me reminiscent of that kind of a quote. You know, we're going to beat the crowd here. And then he also talks about the beauty contest, the famous Keynesian beauty contest. He says, professional investment may be likened to those newspaper competitions in which the competitors have to pick out the six prettiest faces from a hundred photographs. Back in England in the 1920s and 1930s, they'd have these contests where they'd show a hundred faces on the newspaper, and your job was to pick out the six prettiest. And you won, though, if you were exactly matched what the average thought was the prettiest. It wasn't the prettiest, per se. It was what the crowd thought was the prettiest. That's the beauty contest analysis. So he says the prize is awarded to the competitor whose choice most nearly corresponds to the average preference of the competitors as a whole. So this is what investing has gotten down to. You're just trying to think about what's the crowd thinking and how can I anticipate what they're doing. So the pushback on this would be, well, won't serious-minded long-term investors dominate these game players? He says, no. Investments based on genuine long-term expectations are so difficult as to be practical. People who are investing in the stock market, Kane says, they should do that, or they can just try and beat the gun and out with the other person. And that's what a lot of people will choose to do, because this long-term investment is way too hard. It's easier to be a momentum player. He says human nature also desires quick results, and he talks about institutional investors will not tolerate long-term investing. Institutions will not tolerate long-term investing. And he goes on and quotes what I think is the most fabulous quote ever as an investment manager myself. He says, well, why will institutions not tolerate long-term investing? Because this behavior, this long-term behavior, by, by really has to be eccentric, unconventional, and rash in the eyes of average opinion. If he is successful, that will only confirm the general belief in his rashness. And if in the short run he is unsuccessful, which is likely, he will not receive much mercy. Worldly wisdom teaches that it's better for your reputation to fail conventionally than to succeed unconventionally. But if you think about it, to me at least, it makes a lot of sense. If, you, if you're an investment manager, you are. Somebody asked, one of our clients asked us, how can we make you a better investment manager, Jeff? How can we do that? And honest to God, I don't know why I said this. I said, give me a five-year contract. Well, that would do it. I would let my bets play out. You know, I'm not. We're not GMO, our company, you know, Grantham. That those, there's some guys out there that can let their bets play out. They're, they don't have to worry about career risk, right? Some companies have to worry about career risk. That's a real risk out there. And so that, to me, if you can get that, this is kind of the, the idea for lockup and same kind of things. If you can get the lockup, private equity, those kind of things, you can do things differently. And if you're subject to, 
constant you know, um, appraisal, not just by your client, but by the consultant, right? Okay? He talks about in section six, speculation. He tries to distinguish speculation from enterprise, speculation forecasting the psychology of the market, enterprise forecasting the prospective returns of assets over their whole life. And this is such a great quote. He says, speculators may do no harm as bubbles on a steady stream of enterprise. So if the economy is going well, if there's a steady stream of enterprise, speculation, not so bad, just a little bubble on the steady stream of enterprise. But the position is serious when enterprise becomes the bubble on a whirlpool of speculation. Dot com. When the capital development of a country becomes the byproduct of the activities of casino, the job is likely to be ill done. It, it is a little reminiscent of dot com. It is a little reminiscent to me of 07 and 08, isn't it? You know, it, it, to me, I think that kind of run, uh, rings uh, quite true, this idea that we can have these bubbles. And this is, again, is Keynes saying, you know, look, gambling in Atlantic City, that's fine. If you want to play the lottery, that's fine. Not to worry, no big deal. But if you're gambling in the stock market and influencing all these kind of decisions and those kind of things feed into the real economy, that's not good. That's not good. That's kind of where he's going here. That's kind of what, at least I think he's saying. He says, the spectacle of modern investment markets uh, has sometimes moved me towards the conclusion that to make the purchase of an investment permanent and indissoluble, like marriage, might be u useful remedy of our contemporary evils. For this would force the investor to direct his mind to long-term prospects. So here, you know, to me, immediately, I start thinking about, you know, you need some kind of a tax to, to stop this trading. It, it also is these long-term lockups, that sort of thing. Long-term lockups can be helpful. Um, Warren Buffett just had his annual meeting with, in Omaha. And what is the price of Warren Buffett stock? Does anybody know Berkshire Hathaway? It's up in the number. The, the high, highly priced one. One sixteen hundred sixty-nine thousand. He likes keeping it that way because he's going to keep out the riffraff. You know, he doesn't want this, a lot of active traders in there flipping him back and forth. So he likes it very high, I think, partly because of this. He, he, you don't want all those people mucking around in the, in the stock. He goes on to say, the introduction of, substantial of a substantial government transfer tax on the all transactions might prove the most serviceable reform available with a view to mitigating the predominance of speculation in the United States. So this is kind of like the Tobin tax or this transactions tax we're talking about in Europe, right? Try and cut down on speculation because it's not healthy for the, um, for the stock market. Too much volatility. That's kind of his basic view. I think in Europe they think that, but they also like the fact that they can raise, you know, $40 billion or something on, on these taxes. Okay. Um, he says, apart from instability due to speculation, there is instability due to human nature. Our decision to do something can only be taken as a result of animal spirit. Here's the famous animal spirit. The spontaneous urge to action rather than inaction and not as the outcome of a weighted average of quantitative benefits multiplied by quantitative probabilities. Again, not working that way. Animal spirits is just sort of your gut telling you something. Um, this means that economic... handout on your table. I'll just, I'll just read the last uh, set. We're almost done. Yeah. He says, um, he says, this means that economic prosperity is excessively dependent on a political and social atmosphere which is congenial to the average businessman. So he's saying this animal spirit stuff is really important. You have to create an environment where people want to take risks and they have confidence about the playing field in the future. He goes on to say, if animal spirits are dimmed, leaving us to depend on nothing but mathematical expectation, enterprise will fade and die. So to me, I read that and I say, are you listening, Barack Obama? You know, you really have to create an atmosphere where people want to take a chance, take risks, right? Well, somewhat. I mean, somewhat. Solving all these problems. 
I've got two more slides to go. And in fact, as I mentioned, you all should have a copy of this if you like. And I'm actually on page, what page is it? Page 38, believe it or not. But there's two more slides to go. So let me just read this to you. Again, this is section eight. And he said, he says, after giving full weight to the importance of changes in long-term expectations, I am now somewhat skeptical of the success of a merely monetary policy directed towards influencing the rate of interest. So what is he saying? I mean, he's saying, to me, he's saying, you know, we're in a liquidity trap because he's writing, you know, rates are really low already and it's not going to work. It's changing rates won't work. You've got to do something else. You've got to lift the people's spirits. You've got to, you know, do something. And he's actually not convinced that that's doable. He thinks the government should come in and spend some sense. That's what we have to do right now. He says, um, the final word, he says, is practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt. And this is a very famous quote. So the last slide, practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from, an intellectual, from any intellectual influences are usually the slaves of some defunct economy. Mad men in authority who hear voices in the air or distilling their frenzy from some academic scribbler of a few years ago. So he's sort of saying, hey, you know what? Our, our economists, they're, they're actually pretty good. They have some really good ideas and ultimately they get into policy. I think that's what he's saying there. Um, anyway, um, that is the end. I have a little appendix, but we won't go through that. Um, that's the end of the presentation. I really appreciate you all listening. Um, I should say that I started to read about Keynes a couple years ago, read a couple of biographies, and then this, this academic article came out, and that's kind of what was the genesis for trying to put together this presentation. But as I've read more and more, it's just, he's just kind of an interesting guy, and you learn a lot about history, and I think learn a lot about investing when you, when you read about Keynes. So I could be happy to take some questions. I know we've run on, so if people need to leave, no big deal. I'll just kind of hang out here, and I could take them right now. And Well, right, and I, I do think that, you know, when, remember, there's one thing to remember, though. Keynes is into, he thinks that the government should spend, because they spend on social welfare programs. Not according to Keynes, infrastructure. That's the kind of investment funding Keynes wants. He doesn't want us to go down this road of a social welfare state. Keynes is, you know, you have to remember, he is, um, you know, he, he once said, if it comes to a class war, count me on the side of the educated bourgeoisie. I mean, he's, he's very much not, you know, in terms of social welfare spending. And I've often asked my question, myself the question in reading about him was, was, was Keynes a generous man? He certainly supported the arts, and he wanted to get unemployment up. But it, I don't know if it was because he really felt so badly about people. He just, well, that will get aggregate demand up, and everything will, you know, will work better. So I just, uh, that aspect of Keynes, I think, is important to kind of think about and understand that, that Again, he, he didn't have that view. I think he cares, you know, f about the debt. The debt. I don't know how he would feel about all this debt. I mean, I suspect. I think I was saying to some people earlier that, you know, if you're in a classroom taking macroeconomics 101, and somebody says, "What should we do right now?" The answer is, "Well, you should spend more. Deficit spend, and we should solve our entitlement problems later." The problem is, there's no trust in Washington. I mean, that may be what's the right answer on the paper, but in the real world of politics and how things get done in, in Washington and elsewhere, they're never going to cut spending, are they? Later? Even if they say they are. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I think there's just this, this ideological battle right now between, because there's no trust, partly. There's just no trust. Right. That's the answer in the classroom. Why don't you do it? Because they're they're, they're never because they're never going to cut spending later on. They're never going to do it. And by the way, they're going to invest it on infrastructure, just like the 800 billion stimulus package was on infrastructure. It wasn't on infrastructure. That's the point. I think that's 
it's, it's a real world counter to what I think is makes all the sense in the world, I think, and I think most academic economists would kind of agree with what you're saying, but then you got into the politics. Where does that lead you? Yes. It wouldn't surprise me that I hadn't read that. I mean, he was an expert in currencies, and, and as I mentioned early on in his career, and he had a lot to do with funding you know, World War I expenditures by the British. But he actually spent some time in India, actually. I didn't, couldn't go through everything, but he, he spent about a year or two on, in, uh, working for Britain in India, and um, he learned a lot about currency trading then. He wrote a quite a famous um, text, I suppose it would be, on valuation of the Indian currency how the gold standard played into that. So he learned a lot about that. So he, he may have done that, but I just don't know that. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I think he was, he was, he was encouraging the FDI to do more spending. I mean, that's certainly for sure, and very encouraging to get off the gold standard because he thought that was very constrictive. But you know, Federal Reserve policy, I, don't, I just don't recall what he was really saying. I'm certainly in conventional wisdom, and I still was too tight. You know, they, they did exactly the wrong thing. Friedman and Schwartz's book on that suggests that they were, they were, they, they. They just were too tight. They pushed interest rates up, and some people think, I guess, that might have happened in 28, 29 as well, that helped push how the stock market went from 29 down. Okay, take care. Anything else? Yes. Hey. Yeah, I do. There were 100. It was a special kind of index that one of the authors created to try and represent the broad UK market. So there was a hundred stocks in that index. And in fact, it is a little, you know, if, if you're trying to get a handle on, say, stock market investing, it, it is true that the Cambridge endowment that he ran, I think the number of stocks in it was something like 60 to 75 percent of the portfolio was stocks at any one time. And then there was a, some was in real estate, some was in bonds. He had a, a portion of it was in U.S. equities. So he's, you know, he's not. It's, this is not a pure of today. Today's age would, would look at you know what's the benchmark. You know, if you're if you're an S and P 500 type guy, but you're going out of index buying small and mid cap and international, et cetera, well, you're adding value that way. Well, I guess, but um, most people wouldn't like that kind of stuff. They'd rather you be pure in terms of. You know, S and P 500 stocks. <laughs> well, a few times I've done it in Alaska four times, and I'm going to do it in Michigan here in next month. So, just started actually. No, no political reason, just kind of personal interest. I've always been interested in Keynes. Um, I'm kind of, uh, you know, I, I'd like to see more presentations, actually, on Charles Spencer when I retire. Um, so I'm kind of thinking about doing that. And I've, I've, I've done presentations now on a number of topics. I mean, I did one last year. I thought I'd do one every year, actually. So like the year before, I did uh, derivatives and their disasters, talking about derivative securities and, and what are they and how do they work, and then focused in on specific um, you know, Bain, Bank, and Nick Leach and specific disasters of the derivatives. And then I last year I did Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, which, which was really a focus on white collar criminals from Charles Ponzi to, to uh, Madoff to WorldCom to Enron, so that kind of thing. So I just kind of want to get a little repertoire on whatever, four or five presentations, and I, I kind of enjoy doing it and learning about these things, and uh, usually a little bit to do with history, because I kind of like financial history, so I try and do it. 
that's that's kind of why I'm doing it. But it's just it's like anything, you know. If you really want to learn something, you got to teach it, or you got to try and do a presentation. Because otherwise, it, it, it you just don't quite have the same intensity and rationale to do it. Yeah, I mean, changes provide support for that, but again, it's not completely clear to me that how he would feel about the, the level of debt that we have now. And, and you know, you have the Rogoff Reinhardt that have been out there talking about debt as being a constraint on growth ultimately. Now, of course, there's a little kerfuffle about that because apparently there's some spreadsheet errors in what they were doing. And whether or not that completely changes their um, uh, uh, conclusions or not, I think they would say, well, no, it doesn't actually. But the other side, you know, there's politics, and it's, aha, you see, they've, they've been completely discredited. Well, not really, but that's the way politics works, I guess. And even, golly, among economists, even, they're, they're willing to, to do that. best video ever made was that if you know you can go onto the internet and go Keynes versus Hayek and you'll see the fight of the century. It's fantastic. It's, a, it's fantastic. You know, just go to YouTube and do it. Um, and they were, it talks, it's a rap video and it talks about this, this two schools of thought and they have been fighting about the role of government and et cetera for, you know, since the 1930s and 40s, I suppose, anyway, probably for many, many years before that. But that's, that's been, um, that's been going on. I'm conservative, and I would prefer that we have less government, I guess, and I'm a little concerned that we're going down the road of more government, and, and particularly more of the entitlement spending, and I think that, you know, you end up, you end up, I think in some ways, um, Arthur Brooks at AEI has written about kind of a learned helplessness, is the phrase he used, a learned helplessness on the part of a lot of people who continue to get more and more benefits, and I think that's the concern that, that you know, I mean, it's, you know, give a man a fish, you for a day, teach a man to fish, and you'll feed him for a lifetime, that kind of thing. And I think, so that bothers me a little bit, but you know, I'm, I'm also optimistic. I mean, I see money and the internet and the connections and the brain power out there. You know, we can, there's all kinds of negatives, there always has been, but I feel like there's so many people thinking of, of new things that we haven't, can't even imagine right now, that I, I just generally think that growth will ultimately improve, but I also think that debt is a constraint. I mean, I, I, my basic view is that, you know, we, we got into this mess because we live beyond our means. That's a little bit Hayekian in a way, meaning that, you know, a after the boom comes the bust. That's a Hayekian kind of thing. Keynes would say, well, I just want the boom to keep going on. And he kind of said that in a way. Um, but I kind of think, you know, you live beyond your means. You make promises that you can't keep, so now you have to you know, you have to um, save more and spend a little less. That's the way it works. That's just my view. But it does, and Keynes was the inventor of, of that idea. I got to, um, I think I got to run because I got another appointment here in about 15 minutes. I really appreciate you guys all coming out. Thank you for staying.